Uh, good evening, folks. I'm uh, Len Rydell, the executive director of the Blue and Gray Education Society, and I'd like to welcome you uh, again to uh, uh, another of our uh, weekly Zoom chats with uh, some of the historians of the BGS's Field University program. Uh, this evening, uh, we're working with, uh, with uh, Paul Severance, who is a um, uh, a retired professor, still, I believe, uh, doing some work with the uh, National Defense University, the Eisenhower School up at Fort McNair in uh, Washington, D.C., and he'll be doing a program for us on the uh, seven days campaign um, uh, from a leadership perspective that will take place. Uh, we're planning to do it uh, early or about the middle part of April, and if um, uh, COVID uh, is still a bit of a problem since we haven't got clearance to get started again yet um, uh, from our board or the insurance company, um, uh, um, uh, we would push it back a month uh, into about the second week of May, just before Gordon Ray's program on, um, on uh, the Overland campaign. Uh, what I'd also like to uh, point out is um, uh, our first uh, conference was uh, with, um, with um, Greg Mertz about Shiloh, and then last week we had Tim Smith talking about Grierson's Raid. Paul's going to talk about the Seven Days program. Next week uh, at this time, uh, Bob Jenkins is going to talk about his Atlanta program on uh, Dalton and, and Rosaka. And then the week after that, uh, the first week of February, we're with um, uh, Scott uh, Hartwig talking about uh, Gettysburg Day One. And uh, the second week of February, Gordon Ray will be on with us to talk about uh, the first half of the Overland campaign. So we've got a, a very robust um, um, uh, uh, set of uh, talks for you. And these are going to run all the way into uh, June as it plans now, and then we'll probably expand it a bit further. But for right now, uh, every Wednesday night, and um, uh, you should be getting announcements. Uh, the next one will be announced uh, on Friday, uh, which is Jenkins' program, and attached to that will be the um, the the um, video of this interview that you can watch again or share with friends or see at any other time if you want to in the event that you possibly have to pop off early here tonight. Our intent is to um, uh, run for approximately one hour. Uh, we, are, we are staying pretty close to that so that everybody can have some predictability. Um, uh, the way we have structured this at the uh, convenience of the speakers are um, we have set up a preset a group of questions to move this uh, this ahead. Uh, you'll see up on your screen right now some instructions that we invite you to submit up to three questions that you might like to ask uh, Paul about the seven days and or the seven days program. As we go through and I moderate uh, what's going on and move the the um, the program ahead. Uh, when Paul is talking, I'll be surveying on the uh, chat screen um, questions that have come in, and I'll determine whether or not to interrupt uh, and interject that in the midst of Paul's answer, or perhaps hold on to it to the end, or perhaps if it doesn't fit in the flow of what we're doing, I may not ask the question. Uh, that hasn't been a problem up until now in the two previous weeks. But just as soon as you think that you're not going to have a problem, we'll get flooded with questions. And clearly, I'm showing that we've got uh, about uh, 27, 28 people on right now. Invariably, I can't get to all those questions or we'd be going till midnight. And I don't intend to do that. Um, what uh, I do want you to uh, appreciate and respect are a couple of administrative things that we've learned in the first couple of weeks. Um, first, um, uh, if you do not, uh, if you are not yet mu muted, uh, you need to mute your uh, your mic. Um, if you groan, grumble, cough, whatever, with an open mic, uh, it gets fed and it, it becomes part of the record. Um, also, because the number of people here 
Uh, I don't want this to descend into some anarchy because you can't really see each other and I don't want people talking over each other and so forth. So for right now, we're regulating what we're doing um, uh, with that. The questions are intended uh, about, uh, I'll run until about 8.35 or 8.40 with the uh, structured questions. And then from 8.40 until nine o'clock, I'll take uh, questions from the audience that I will feed to Paul. And then uh, last call on a question will probably be around 8.55, 8.57. And um, I will let Paul answer that um, um, and we'll see where that goes. The other thing I will ask Paul to do is by and large for questions with uh, you all so that we can get in as many as, as we can in that 20 minute period is uh, the, that I would like to, um, uh, the, the answers to be relatively concise, unless it's a great question. Paul says, that's a really great question. I'd like to talk about that a little bit, in which case it's always Paul's right to uh, do what he wishes to do with that. But I'm going to try to push this forward and so forth. Um, what I also ask you to do in working with this is don't um, fiddle around with the screen or anything. What we find is sometimes those things end up on the screen and it's distracting to the group as a whole. Sit back, relax, enjoy, and listen to what's going on. And if you've got any comments or any question, uh, forward them to us. I also ask you not to chat between each other on chat while we're going through this. That's distracting because those come up on my screen initially. And as I look to see what we have and so forth, it becomes a challenge uh, for me to stay focused on talking with Paul and then trying to deal with what, uh, with what your comments may be. And they may not be relevant at all to what I'm doing or what Paul's doing. So uh, please keep your chat to strictly uh, 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 straight up questions. Um, I, um, I, I see somebody who knows uh, this before has raised their hand. Um, I'm not calling on people raising hands. If you want to send me a question or a comment, uh, please do that. And I'll check the chat as we go through that. But by and large, um, uh, that's how we're going to run this thing uh, for this. And I, I appreciate uh, y'all's cooperation and participation. And I hope you really enjoy this and have a great time. Karen, do you have anything you want to add before we get started? Okay, I'll assume that by by no, uh, her I, I had to unmute myself. Sorry about that. Oh, okay, go ahead. Yeah, just want to introduce you guys to the Lincoln Archives uh, project. It's a public service project. Uh, we're in the process of digitizing all of the federal records that were created during Lincoln's administration. So uh, enjoy the program. Thanks, Karen. And and I might also say uh, a really first rate project that uh, Karen has been working uh, on. I've known Karen for 20, 20 or more years and um, uh, she really has busted her hump on that project and it is a, it's a great project and well worthy of support. So I encourage you to take a look at that and, and go check it out uh, uh, as you move through this. Okay, I'm, I'm ready to get going if you're ready, Karen. And uh, Paul, are you good to go? Yeah, I'm ready. Um, we can start off. Let me, uh, uh, just by way of introduction, if anybody has any questions and wants to follow up, let me give you my email address. I'm always uh, happy to engage. So it's a severance, S-E-V-E-R-A-N-C-E-P at Comcast.net. And if you, uh, you know, you want to continue this dialogue for the next six weeks, I'm fine. That's good. That's my, that's what I do living. And uh, so i um, glad to, uh, engage in what I call intellectual popcorn, just, you know, bounce ideas and perceptions and things like that back and forth. So glad to have everybody here looking forward. Uh, the first thing I'll start with, who can identify my hat? Um, and, uh, you know, if I, uh, if you get the right answer, I'll send you one of my personal challenge coins. Okay. So we'll see how that goes. So I'm going to take my hat off. 
That's what it looks like. What unit is that? Okay, Len, back to you. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm glad to be moderating this. <laughs> uh, Paul, we've uh, known each other just a couple of years. We met, of course, at uh, Fort McNair and, and looking at the um, uh, Lincoln assassination uh, project and so forth there. And, and I've gotten uh, to, uh, to know and appreciate you a great deal over this time. But uh, for most people here, because of uh, the hallowed halls in which you have worked and, uh, and uh, the coverings that you have had for years and years, uh, could you open up by maybe uh, telling us a little bit about your professional studies and what you did as a professor at the National Defense University? Sure. Um, first off, uh, most of you need to understand that I, uh, I spent 30 years in the Army. I was an Army aviator helicopter pilot, so I'm deaf. So if you ask a question, talk loud, I don't have my ears in. Um, <clears throat> my, uh, my longing, and that's the word for it, for the Civil War started when I was a young kid. I grew up during the uh, centennial of the uh, Civil War. My first book, real book I ever read was Bruce Catton's uh, This Hallowed Ground. My uh, sixth grade uh, teacher said, you can't read that, that's too, smart. that's too much for you. I read it, I loved it. I was uh, captured by the uh, uh, events of Preston Brooks caning uh, Senator Sumner in the halls of Congress and uh, Fort Sumter and I, 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 that's it, I was off. Anything I could get after that, uh, McKinley Cantor was big at the time, uh, Red Badge of Courage, Uncle Tom's Cabin. And so it just infused in me a lifelong, uh, you know, fire for the uh, Civil War. Even in my time during the, uh, the military, I taught uh, military history at Northeastern University when I was at Fort Devens in uh, Massachusetts. I would go down and uh, that you know, further fueled my interest in history and also insignia collecting. I have a massive collection of U.S. Army uh, distinctive insignia, almost 12,000 pieces, and every one of them tells a historical story, whether it's the 7th Cavalry under, uh, you know, uh, George Custer, or whether it's the 24th Infantry, which was a black uh, infantry unit, it, it, it just, uh, it, it fueled this lifelong desire in me uh, for history. As far as my professional studies, um, as an aviator, I have been a, uh, I was a school trained certified aircraft accident investigator for the Army, and uh, also safety and maintenance, and I uh, was also a test pilot. But I had the um, chance to attend the air as an army officer, Air Command Staff College uh, at uh, Maxwell Air Force Base in Montgomery. And one of the options they had at that time was studying battlefield commanders. And I, I took Robert E. Lee and the Seven Days Battle as the subject of my thesis. And I built my research and study around the uh, principles of war, the nine principles of war adopted in the early 20s by the uh, US Army and the uh, Marine Corps. And so that's my direct interest in the seven days battle. In 1991, I attended the Industrial College of the Armed Forces and became totally immersed into strategy. And in 1993, I went back on the faculty and spent 25 years there teaching military strategy, warfare, military geography, maritime uh, strategy, um, and really immersed myself into, myself into the idea of the value of theoretical enduring principles, theories, precepts, concepts that underlie the development of strategy and operational planning at strategic operational and tactical levels. From 1995 to uh, 2018, I ran the Gettysburg Studies Program, 
uh, at the uh, uh, ICAF and then the Eisenhower School, as Len mentioned. And I use this particular construct of principles and uh, theories, whatever you want to call that, as a way to ana analyze and then get your hands around decision making and leadership under pressure. That was my focus. How do leaders respond, uh, you know, when the heat's on? And what's the most effective way for leaders to gauge the unfolding situation and then decide uh, what do I do now? So my, my principle is, this is real simple. Um, as far as strategy is three questions. What, so what, now what? And that's the way I kind of approach my studies with my students. What's happened here? What do we know? So what, why do we care? Why is it important? What should we focus on? And then now what, what do we do? And there, therein lies the essence for me of strategic thinking, uh, very simple uh, format, but a lot of complex underpinning in terms of theoretics, if you will. Uh, and so that's what I carried forward into my studies of uh, the Civil War. I've done close to uh, 500 rides at various battlefields uh, to include World War II battlefields. I've done uh, Normandy, uh, Arnhem, uh, Bridge Too Far, and uh, Bulge uh, when I was stationed there for three years. And uh, that's kind of my paradigm, if you will, a framework for analysis of how I approach uh, my staff rides uh, for the uh, Civil War. So that's kind of it in a uh, yeah. nutshell. You have an interesting um, clientele. And, and of course, one of the things I think that um, is, uh, is attractive to me as an education organization and as, uh, as an educational planner is to expose people to a lot of different perspectives on uh, uh, different professional historians and how they look at things. What's really fascinating for me about what you do and have done is your audience. Uh, your audience is different for the most part than, than most of ours. And, and uh, of course that audience is senior um, uh, government officials and general officers uh, who are in the advanced service schools of the United States. Um, uh, what was uh, your purpose in conducting staff rides for that level of people? And um, uh, what uh, leadership uh, principles did you primarily focus on with the generals and the senior uh, government officials? Yeah, uh, good question. I mean, I think from a uh, fundamental point of view, I kind of uh, grasp the idea of the estimate of the situation, uh, the estimate of the unfolding situation for senior leaders to understand how historical incidents and historical events uh, can be instructive. Now, in, in, in doing that, you know, one of the problems I ran into, or I think we still run into, we tend to judge um, leadership and decision-making based on our contemporary view of, you know, what went wrong, you know? The classic case is, how did Lee order Pickett's charge? Why? Well, you know, we don't know exactly uh, what happened there, but we, we have an idea of what he saw. And we have an idea of his leadership characteristics. We have an idea of his relationship with Longstreet. Uh, we have an idea of his purpose, his objectives, his offensive spirit on the third day at Gettysburg. So we can study that and say, okay, now, given the same types of parameters and uh, experiences and what you see, what you know, what you don't know, uh, how would a senior leader 
uh, respond to that. So for me, the estimate of the situation, which is a very formalized, you know, step-by-step, -step, you know, uh, process by which you can come up with a course of action to pursue um, is a very, very important skill for senior leaders. And that's what I try to instill in them is you need to be able to go through uh, this process um, uh, methodically, if you will, and then make a decision. And then the leadership characteristics take over after that, because then you need to motivate, you need to drive the process, you need to be at the point of action. And that's what's really interesting about the Civil War to me is in the lack of technology for communications, how did leaders exercise leadership on the battlefield uh, at the point of the spear? And it's, it's a, a, an amazing study. And that's why the seven days, I think, is, is so interesting because of uh, the fact that the leaders had to be there. They had to see, they had to process, they had to understand um, what was going on to make uh, effective uh, decisions. The second part is, and this is kind of squirrely, I get it, is how do you instill conceptual unity in the chain of command? I understand the principle of unity of command. That's a formal structural thing. But the intellectual process of getting all your leaders and staff, we don't think much about staff, and staff to think about um, commander's intent uh, commander's concept of operation and commander's operational approach. And how do you get that percolated, you know, down through all levels, levels of command so that subordinate commanders in the absence of direct leadership can make decisions in front of their eyes with what's unfolding. Um, you know, to me, the classic case is strong Vincent, again, at Gettysburg, uh, fits John Porter uh, in the seven days uh, at Gaines Mill covering the army's uh, retreat. Uh, he had that conceptual understanding of what McClellan wanted and was able to execute, even though McClellan was far away from the scene of the action. One of the characteristics uh, in three or four of the engagements of the uh, seven days. You know, it's, um, uh, I, 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 I know after 27 years of doing such, uh, so many of these things and, and having done a number of staff rides myself with some of the intel agencies and so forth, I realize that the expectations of your customers are uh, significant and each one is tailored, of course, to the audience you're working with. And I would, I would think that um, uh, having seen you on a couple of battlefields uh, before we talked here, uh, that uh, you engage real well, but how do you prepare for an, an audience that you're gonna do with, and what do you expect from your audience in terms of, of preparation for the cohort that you're gonna work with? What, how do you prepare, and what is it that you like your audience to do to prepare for the engagement? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. The uh... The more you know about the audience, and I, and I got to tell you, the Blue Gray Education Society is a tough audience because it's a eclectic, uh, educated, interested, committed group of folks, and trying to anticipate expectations with a group like that is really hard. It's tough. And I'll give you the other side of the example. I took a, I, I do rides focused on intelligence with intelligence units. I do rides focused on medical with medical units. I even did one ride with a dental unit, a bunch of dentists, you know, and I knew what they wanted. I mean, I sat down and I, I've got this, this massive list of topics. I said, what do you want to talk about? Tell me what's interesting to you. Uh, and, you know, I would send that out and they would come back and say, yeah, I would like to talk about this. That's easy. But with a group like our group, I mean, this is it. It's fun because it, it's kind of like a carnival 
you don't know uh, what's coming next around the corner, what's the next ride and who's going to be there. I mean, the first ride I did with, uh, with Blue Gray uh, was just a ball. I mean, it was just crazy. And everybody there had different expectations and the expectations emerged as we went through the ride. Now, obviously the degree to which I can prepare um, a ride to cover as many different areas um, is useful, but I've, I've kind of developed a template for my rides that I think is successful. Um, obviously the first condition is the narrative, what happened here, who, what, when, where, why, Yep, got it. And then I focus on five different areas in my ride, my rides. The first one is the value of intelligence and information. How does that inform uh, leadership and decision-making on the battlefield? Uh, the second one is the impact of technology. The character, the nature of war never changes. It's always violent. It's always emotional. Uh, it, it's, you know, Clausewitzian view of warfare never changes. But the character of warfare changes. And one of the major changes in warfare is technology and how people or soldiers or leaders adapt to technology uh, in terms of tactics, in terms of planning, in terms of um, medical care, whatever the might, case might be. That's interesting. The third one uh, has to do with logistics. Um, you know, how long can a unit sustain itself in the field in the 19th century uh, scheme of logistics, where the horse was the motive power of uh, 19th century warfare? Today, it's jet fuel, fuels, uh, and fuel, uh, how we conduct warfare in 19th century. It's something as simple as a horse and a mule. Uh, and then I look at the bigger picture, of course, of what principles, concepts, virtues that have enduring value uh, from a warfare and strategy point of view, how were they employed or not employed uh, in the campaign, the battle, the engagement, whatever. And then finally, of course, what were the outcomes and effects um, of the, uh, of the engagement. So somewhere in there, I find I can probably accommodate 90% of people's interests. If it's a doctor, if it's an artillery guy, if it's a signal guy, if it's women in the civil war, I can talk about that all day long. Uh, talk about blacks in the civil war. I always talk about that because that's an important uh, consideration in 19th century American uh, civil war, warfare. So that's my going in template. And then, break, break, as an adult educator, PhD in adult learning, I rely on my board to participate. I want them to contribute. I want them to offer observations. I want them to offer myths that they've heard. I'll break them. I'll bust the myths. No problem. Uh, I want them to ask questions. I want them, as one of our uh, 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 people here tonight, I want them to talk about relatives, uh, forebears that were at the battle, 85th Pennsylvania, we talked about tonight. Um, I want to hear that. I want them to contribute and be uh, part of a larger collaborative uh, learning intervention. That's that's my that's kind of my mantra as a educator. So that's how I I kind of prepare up front. Um, if I can get some information, fine. If not, I got my template. And three, uh, third, I rely on my people uh, that I'm sitting on the bus with or in the van. In this case, uh, as we go, that makes sense. Sure does. Appreciate it. Um, uh, that's that's a great transition. Let's get into the seven days. Um, uh, why is McClellan in front of Richmond in June of 1862? Say again. 
I said, um, uh, this is a good transition into the seven days. Uh, right. Why is McClellan in front of Richmond in June of 1862? Well, yeah, yeah, that's a great, that's another great question. I mean, uh, obviously, you know, when McClellan comes in to pick up the, you know, the uh, trash after uh, First Manassas, um, he does a great job of reorganizing and uh, going into core structures and divisions that we didn't have at the uh, first bull run and building a magnificent army. Like McDowell, McClellan soon gets immersed into on to Richmond. That was one of the fundamental mantras, actually in both sides, north, south, was to capture the capital as a political uh, objective of military operations. And eventually, uh, McClellan, you know, you got basically three routes to get to the south. You can go down the Shenandoah Valley, which takes you further away from, or up the Shenandoah, away from Richmond. You can go down to Piedmont, which is where most of the action takes place, Rapidan, uh, Rappahannock, uh, Warrington, Brandy Station, pick one, or you can go by sea. And this is the advantage that the uh, Union has. So McClellan comes up initially with this idea after being pushed and pushed and pushed. Stanton comes in in uh, you know, December um, as uh, the uh, Secretary of War uh, the idea is on the Richmond. There is this focused uh, thought that if you capture the Richmond, the war is over. Lincoln understood that it's more important to destroy the army. As long as a nation can keep an army in the field, they have a right to claim sovereignty. Get rid of the army, you can do whatever you want. So his first plan is to go down up the York River to Urbana. Instead of going over Klan at the time through Johnson's defenses at Manassas and Manassas Junction in that area, uh, is to come in and flank them and then quick overland route uh, to Richmond, capture Richmond, war's over. That's the thinking. Mm, not so fast. Uh, Johnson, who never um, uh, ignored a chance to retreat, uh, falls back. Uh, outside Richmond and the Urbana plan is gone. That's the genesis of the Peninsula campaign, down to Fort Monroe, up the Peninsula. Uh, and of course, McClellan's view of warfare is advanced by steady stages and siege warfare. Where did he get this idea? Well, he was an observer to the Crimean War in 1856-57, Although he missed the Battle of Sevastopol, he studied that siege operation immensely. He's an engineer. He advances by stages. And so McClellan, and we're not going to go into the, obviously, the Peninsula Campaign in, in great detail, but let's just take one June, you know, 1862 as a departure date. Joe Johnston has been wounded. Uh, Lee has been put in charge of the army. Uh, you know, McClellan's army can see the spires of Richmond. And the idea is I'm going to capture Richmond and destroy uh, the capital of the Confederacy. <clears throat> so Lee comes on board and throts that plan uh, with starting with the seven days and on the 25th of June, really. Uh, but that's why McClellan is there. His plan is to capture Richmond, end the war, dissolve the Confederacy, and, uh, you know, go home and, um, as a conquering hero. So that's his, that's why he's there. And, and course, it's interesting. Yeah, interesting point. Um, um, you know, when you look at that and you realize, of course, that he has been in the vicinity of Richmond for the better part of a month, um, uh, what, what factors do you think have limited his ability to execute his plans? Well, uh, uh, again, great question. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure some of the folks uh, listening can uh, talk to this with some degree of uh, uh, emotion. Number one, in my view, was his view of warfare. There's, 
a continuing debate that McClellan wanted to minimize casualties. If you read his reports of some of the casualties in the early stages, uh, he's very, very touched by losing his troops. So going back to his experience studying the Crimea, and he, from the Crimea, he went on to study um, European warfare in some detail. It's this battle of siege. It's siege warfare. Wear them down, minimum casualties, advance by stages, and win in the most bloodless manner you can. And I think that's as part of McClellan's DNA. He, he's, he's not a guy that wants to go out there and uh, effusively shed blood. Two, um, and, and here's the long arm of logistics. Uh, McClellan is hampered by the fact that he's got a long logistics tail. People say that, you know, in warfare, it, there's nine parts. The first part is the head of the tail, the next eight parts, is logistics. And so this is food, ammunition, medical, uh, and in his case, siege cannon, siege artillery, heavyweight, you know, Dahlgrens, 30 pound of parrots, uh, 13 inch mortars, things of that nature. All of that has to be moved. And his army, which is really about 115,000 people, has to be fed. And let me give you one kind of off to the side uh, figure to think about a horse. Okay. Horse, big deal. Horse, a horse eats 26 pounds of food a day, 12 pounds of grain, 14 pounds of hay. If you can't forage, you got to move it. How many horses are in the army of the Potomac? I'm not sure how many were with McClellan, but I know there were 88,000 at Gettysburg and you got to feed those people. Now you got to feed the troops. Now you got to replenish the ammunition. So in large measure, McClellan in the beginning uh, is tied to his logistics trail, um, you know, going back to the uh, to White House uh, on the Pamunkey River. And that's a vulnerability that Lee recognizes and rolls into his planning for what becomes uh, the seven days. So that's a, that's a problem. The third one that really fascinates me is McClellan's failure to use his cavalry as effectively as Lee used his cavalry. If you read the encounters, with the exception of, you know, Philip St. George Cook's attack at Gaines Mill late in the afternoon to, you know, try and salvage uh, the situation, there's very little effective use of Union cavalry. They haven't come in to their own like they did at Brandy Station in 1863. So these three vulnerabilities, and then there's this subtle, I'm going to use the word conflict with his superiors in Washington. Uh, McClellan is always in conflict with, with at this time, Halleck has come east uh, from the West Theater to become general in chief and Stanton and Lincoln. Uh, in my view, McClellan is a study in piss poor civil military relations. And he is always complaining about the lack of support and the lack of troops and the lack of reinforcements from Washington. Compounding that is the fact that McClellan never rejected an overinflated estimate of the enemy's strength. He always thought he was outnumbered, thanks to Alan Pinkerton and his uh, intelligence uh, capacity. And so all these things, I think, play on McClellan's ability to execute a, a fast or quick um, uh, form of mobile warfare on the peninsula. Instead, it becomes a, you know, a very segmented, uh, slow uh, siege type of operation. We know about the operations, took them a month at Yorktown, coming up the peninsula. 
And that was his plan uh, for Richmond. In fact, his very first operation at Oak Grove was to capture the heights uh, on Oak Grove so he can move his artillery forward, start the siege of Richmond. So I think he has a lot of impediments in terms of his operational planning and his operational celerity. That's, that's my view. What, um, you know, seven days, of course, is the, is the coming out party for Robert E. Lee. Um, in your opinion, was uh, Lee prepared for the opportunities that were presented him by assuming the command of the army? And uh, what did he intend to do? And what was, what was success for him? What, what is a measure of success for him? Well, you know, it's an interesting question. I, I, when I looked at that question, I thought, I, I don't, I'm trying to visualize, you know, Robert e. Lee in the Dabs house doing a SWOT analysis. You know what SWOT is? It's yeah. A, yeah, SWOT. And I, I, I can't see it. For Lee, I think, and I, and I think this is an important lesson for leaders at the uh, strategic level. Sometimes the first thing you have to do is keep from losing. You got to keep from losing the war. And I think back to December 8th, 1941, we got to keep from losing. I think to September 12th, 2001, we got to keep from losing before you can start planning to win. And so I think the first imperative, I think for Lee, is how do I keep from losing, i.e., how do I keep McClellan out of Richmond? How do I keep him out of Max Brown's restaurant on Broad Street, you know? Um, and so his initial efforts, of course, uh, are to provide for the defenses of Richmond. He got, he got negative press. They, they call him the, you know, King of Spades, Granny Lee, all of that. But that was a masterful study in economy of force as a principle of war. How can you maximize your defensive capability to a point where you can apply the offensive capability uh, against McClellan? So I, I, I don't know that he saw opportunities in the beginning. I think he was trying to keep from losing uh, as, as a first plan. And then the idea behind that is once I can – feel comfortable about defending, I can go over to the offensive. His initial objectives were to drive McClellan away from Richmond. And secondarily, if he can destroy or severely impair the Army of the Potomac, that would be a great benefit. The opportunities emerged on a daily basis as a result of the engagements in the seven days in an operational sense. And then once he had McClellan, I think bottled up at Harrison's Landing, strategic opportunity presented to go north. And of course that becomes, you know, culminates in, uh, you know, Jackson, Cedar Mountain, uh, Second Manassas, Chantilly, uh, and eventually of course Antietam. Um, so I, I don't know that, in my view, Lincoln, uh, Lincoln, Lee was looking at opportunities as much. He was looking at how do I save the, the day? How do I keep from losing so that I can think about um, how do I win? And then this, it, it's interesting because his plan is superb. It's a superb plan that, you know, captures seven out of the nine principles of war, uh, but it's a complex plan. And under the conditions of geography, which is something I care about deeply, and topography and what I call micro terrain on the battlefield uh, along the uh, Chickahominy, uh, he creates his own opportunities. And then he becomes focused on destroying McClellan's army. Unfortunately, his commanders are not to the task, especially Magruder, Huger, and Holmes. Jackson's performance is kind of interesting. We can talk about that in the staff ride. And the other thing that's interesting, which I don't get, 
is Nelson Pendleton's use of artillery uh, campaign. And, you know, Lee, you know, cashiers, Magruder, Holmes, and um, Huger, he doesn't do anything uh, to uh, Pendleton. And that's kind of a personal relationship. So anyway, opportunities, I don't think he had any in the beginning. He was just trying to save the, uh, you know, save the nation. And then he created his own opportunities that he tried to push through offensive action uh, through the rest of the uh, seven days. That's, that's kind of my take on it. You know, I, th I think, um, uh, I, I really, I think you hit the nail squarely on the head there. As you know, we, we talked a little bit because I, I've spent some time with the peninsula and the seven days campaigns and so forth. And one of the things you raised a point of, which I think is just uh, really spot on as, as relates to Robert E. Lee and even George Gordon meet at Gettysburg. When Lee assumes command, uh, Jeb Stewart brings him a plan uh, that, that he wants to uh, basically head towards uh, Charles city courthouse. And he wants to try to sweep away and, and, and try to create havoc for the, uh, for the Federals uh, early on, early in June. And uh, Lee takes that initiative from that young 29-year-old officer and he appreciates what he's doing. He's going to use that with when he sends him to ride around, but he, 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 he mutes and he sits on Stewart. He doesn't approve of Stewart's plan and proposal to move towards the James River. And he did the same thing when people right at the start of the war when he's trying to organize the defenses of Virginia and people are saying, look, we can go right into Washington, D.C. Nobody's covering anything right now. And he says, we don't have the resources to go there. We could go there, but we'd be chased away right away because we just don't have the forces. And you talked about and you said he didn't want to lose first. He had to get to the point of not losing. And I think that's that's the exact same thing. And it's the criticism that George Meade faced right after he assumes command of the army at Gettysburg is that his first solution is not to lose DC or Baltimore. He'll deal with the offensive later, but he's not gonna lose them initially. So I think you really hit that squarely on the head. And I agree with that completely. Tell me um, uh, what impressed you the most about the seven days? Well, yeah, there's a bunch of things. I mean, number one, it, 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 uh, for me, is geography. Uh, geography of that theater of war is so critical. Uh, there was a lack of maps um, that influences people's ability to command beyond what they can see in, in, in many ways. Uh, it's a tough area, even today. I live down here, okay? I live here. You go out today, I mean, there's, there's not that many roads. Yeah. And it, it, it's pretty, you know, the Chickahominy is not a river. It's a friggin' swamp, you know? Yeah. And, and it, 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 it really creates a, um, uh, a very pervasive natural barrier uh, to military ops. Lee understood that. And I think McClellan did, too after the battle at Beaver Dam Creek. And he said, eh, I got to get everybody on the uh, south side of the river. Uh, the other thing that impresses me is the um, leadership and initiative of the Union subordinate commanders, uh, especially at uh, Glendale and to some degree Savage's Station when McClellan basically abdicated his responsibility as a commander and left the battlefield. And he, and he didn't give his commanders very detailed information on what to do and you know how to, uh, um, how to respond to Lee's offensive action. So guys like Fitz John Porter and uh, Edwin Sumner, um, who are in command, uh, do the best they can. They do a great job. I mean, they really, you know, keep Lee from um, destroying the army at Savage's Station and uh, uh, down at um, Glendale. And then at Malvern Hill, you know, McClellan's basically gone. 
So there was this conceptual unity, I think that at least he instilled in his commanders about changing his base of operations um, you know, from the York River to the James River. And they were able, uh, especially Fitz John Porter, who I think is a, is a very, very capable and brave and courageous soldier who doesn't get much credit. In fact, he gets court-martialed later on. Um, they do a magnificent job on the hook, on the run, uh, defending, um, you know, the, uh, the route of retreat, uh, excuse me, change of base, uh, McClellan uh, to the James River. That's something I find very impressive. One thing I find kind of interesting is how Lee, after the battle, purges his leadership. And he gets rid of Holmes and Huger and Magruder. And then because of this battle, uh, he develops one of the most effective, in my view, command teams in military history. Lee, Longstreet, Jackson, Stewart. Because of the dynamics, the chemistry that evolved during this battle, after the seven days, the Army of Northern Virginia goes on to almost unprecedented uh, success. Moving north, you know, the mountain, uh, uh, Second Manassas, uh, Chantilly, Draw at Antietam, Fredericksburg, Chancellorsville with this incredible four and four horsemen command team that he has built for his army that just achieves incredible success. And that conceptual unity, that trust and confidence that he has instilled in his command team, and then they have instilled in their commanders is what carries the army of Northern Virginia forward until Gettysburg. You know, Jackson's gone by Gettysburg. Stewart is in there. Longstreet's got a case of the ass. He doesn't want to play. But until that point, uh, that is one of the most amazing evolutions of effective command. Kind of reminds me of Patton and the Third Army, you know, during the Second World War, the command team that he put in and how effortlessly they executed. A great point. Um, uh, before I, I turn to a couple of audience questions, um, uh, what um, you know, in looking at this over over many years, what what do you think is most hyped element of the campaign over the years, and uh, why why do you think it's still misunderstood? Well, you know, probably the most hyped element is Stewart's ride around McClellan. You know, um, originally intended to be find out where the right flank is, let me know what, what the vulnerabilities are, especially with the lines of communication. He does that, but right or wrong, and we can talk about this, you know, he decides, I don't think I want to go back the same way. They're going to be waiting for me. So he does this 100-mile circuit, you know, down through Tunstall Station, uh, down to Charles City Courthouse, and, and eventually uh, makes his way back to um, – uh, to Lee. Uh, it's a great morale boost for the South. Uh, you know, he gets great press. Yeah. But there are those critics that say that uh, by doing that, then uh, Stewart tipped off McClellan uh, about uh, Lee's possible courses of action and may have started the germination of the seed where uh, McClellan says, yeah, I got to cut a Cut my, cut my losses here and get away from the York River and, you know, set up something new at, at uh, Harrison's Landing before I continue this offensive. That's kind of a up and down question even today. So that's kind of contra controversial. The second thing, of course, is, uh, you know, hyped up charges. McClellan always thought he was outnumbered. No matter how many troops you gave him, reinforcements, there were always double that on the Confederate side. And that, you know, that plays against McClellan's other successes, the fact that he was just overawed by inflated 
uh, fake news, <laughs> fake news um, uh, on his campaigns. Uh, sure. So those are kind of two of the major areas that uh, sort of stick in my mind. And the third thing, of course, is it, it, it totally changed the fortunes of war for the Confederacy in terms of importance, major victory, although Lee suffered more casualties. I mean, a bunch of casualties doing this wasn't quite a Pyrrhic victory, but, he, you know, he pushed, uh, he saved Richmond and, and bottled up uh, McClellan. But the, it, it totally changed the, the uh, uh, morale, uh, the esprit of the Southern co course or cause uh, because of um, uh, Lee's victories in the uh, seven days. So that's pretty uh, significant in its uh, own right, in my view. Uh, Warren Breezeblatt out in um, uh, Scottsdale, Arizona, has uh, asked, uh, he says uh, that General Lee seemed to have had a habit of making a battle plan and then leaving it up to his subordinates. Uh, uh, Warren thinks uh, in this regard and wants to know your thoughts. Uh, isn't the failure at Glendale really Lee's fault? Well, you know, that's, um, that's, that's one of the great questions of great leadership. You know, Lee, I, I can't remember the occasion, but I, I know that Lee was interviewed at one time about his, his command style. And he said, my job is to bring the army to the right place at the right time. And then I leave it to my subordinates to execute. And that was Lee's style. That was always Lee's style. And, uh, you know, you can, you can argue all day long about delegation. How much should you delegate and leave to your subordinates? It's still a question today about, you know, how much individual initiative do you lead to your subordinates? You give them guidance, you give them support. Uh, but at some point in time, you know, it, it's interesting to me that strategies and campaigns by themselves have no value. What counts? What makes those strategies and campaigns successful is tactical actions. It's tactical actions. And so the degree to which your tactical commanders can achieve success drives how successful your operational campaign plan is or even your overall strategy. So tactical outcomes have operational and strategic impact. And I think Lee, um, by virtue of his leadership style, believed that. And, and he had for the most part, of course, at Glendale, see, part of the problem with Glendale was Magruder. Uh, and, and, and Magruder and Huger and Holmes were the three weak links. Magruder was accused of being sick at that time and taking medication laced with opium. Hey, that's pretty good. You know, sounds like Yule at Gettysburg on day one. <clears throat> but... Um, you know, in those days, Len, you could only, what you could command is what you could see, you know? We didn't have the types of C cube, you know, C3I with radio and space-based assets and all that. So you had to rely on your subordinates to execute. Um, uh, probably the most effective subordinate was A.P. Hill who's aggressive by nature, uh, Longstreet behind him. Jackson has a mixed record in this campaign. Uh, he, he wasn't able to, um, you know, move with the same speed and impact that he did in the Valley campaign or he did at uh, Manassas. Um, but that's Lee's leadership style. And it's pretty successful in the most part. It, and, but, you know, um, Warren's observation about the, the missed opportunity at Glendale is significant. And, and the fact is, uh, you know, Sumner, um, there were three corps at Glendale. They did a pretty good job, oh, by the way, of uh, fending off um, um, Confederate uh, assaults at Glendale until the rest of the army. Remember, McClellan had to move all his supplies and equipment and heavy siege artillery 
behind the lines through Glendale uh, to Harrison's Landing, although he left, you know, 2,500 Union wounded at Savage's Station. He didn't evacuate them. That's kind of sits a micro um, as bad news. Um, but um, it, it's a great point. Now, had Lee been there, I don't know. It, it might have been different. Um, I think back to Mechanicsville. We're late in the afternoon after APL, AP Hill is getting hammered at Beaver Dam Creek. Lee sitting on the other side of uh, uh, Mechanicsville orders in uh, Ripley's brigade at the end of the day to try and turn the uh, battle and gets hammered. Um, you know, I, I don't know. Uh, you know, um, leadership uh, in the Civil War is, is, is a funny thing. You know, people say, why aren't the leaders in front? Well, the leaders are in back because they can see what's going on. You know, and that's that's yeah. where the regimental commanders and the brigade commanders occasionally, you know, you get the strong Vincents, you get the Patrick Cleburne type of guy that gets all front, you know, Lewis Armistead, you know, at the angle. But that's not common. I, uh, I don't know, Warren, does that help? He, he can't talk back to you. Oh, OK. Um, uh, Sarah Ferguson uh, up in Ohio has followed up that question. Um, and, and would like for you to uh, uh, juxtapose your uh, interpretation of Lee's actions at Malvern Hill with uh, his decision to uh, uh, execute Pickett's charge at uh, Gettysburg the next year. Yeah, okay, that probably, <laughs> that's, that's a great question. Uh, I got very strong feelings about Pickett's charge, but let's start at Malvern Hill. Um, I think, I think Lee was focused and it's, it's part of his DNA. If you read his after action reports, he's something like under normal circumstances, we should have, uh, the army of the Potomac uh, should have been destroyed. Lee recognized at Malvern Hill that this was it. And you know, if I don't do it now, I ain't gonna do it. Uh, 10 miles away is Harrison's Landing. Uh, federal gunboats are, you know, dotting the river. Uh, it was kind of a, I'm going to use the word roll of the dice. What happened, two things happened. And, and, and I think these are out of Lee's personal control. First, the artillery that Lee wanted to have brought up uh, to confront the Union artillery at Malvern Hill were so inter, interspersed with his columns coming down from Glendale, he couldn't get enough artillery support to overcome uh, you know, the federal strength that Henry Hunt had set up on uh, Malvern Hill. The second thing is, going back to subordinate commanders, they were piecemeal attacks, brigade at best, regiments in most cases uncoordinated, over an open plain, uh, basically without mass and concentration, uh, doomed the failure. Okay, break, break, Gettysburg. The situation with Gettysburg to me is, you know, people say, how could he order Pickett's charge or, you know, Longstreet's attack or, Pickett, Pettigrew, uh, Trimble, attack, pick one. I don't care. My thinking is, follow me on this, and you can you can rip me apart. Day one, Gettysburg, massive victory. By itself, you take day one of Gettysburg and put it over here somewhere. It's the 23rd largest battle of the Civil War in terms of percentage of troops engaged, casualties, whatever. Big battle, and Lee won. Lee won big. Defeated two corps, drove them back through town. We all know the story of Yule and Pendleton's failure to put artillery on Cemetery Hill. Boom. Second day, he came that close. How many points in the federal line did the Confederates almost get through? 
pick one. Uh, Little Round Top, uh, Wright's Brigade at the Pennsylvania Monument, Boxdale's Brigade uh, down through the uh, Trossel Farm, um, uh, Hoke and Hayes on uh, East Cemetery Hill, uh, Johnson's Division on Culp. They came neck. It's, it, it's like, I don't know if you remember Get Smart, you know? The, yep. I was that close. It was a, it was that close. So now day three. Look, you know, I tried the I tried the ends of the line. <laughs> the middle has got to be the weak point. I think that's a kind of sorry story myself, but um, I get it. If you stand at the Lee Memorial and you look across the field at the angle, it's like oh, shit. That's not that tough. It's fairly you know level ground. It's a little bit uphill. I can get my artillery out there, point the fur, as he called it. Uh, I might be able to get over there, and with Stuart coming up from the back and uh, Yule or Johnson on Culp's Hill, um, I might do this. More important to me is Lee's thinking. Look, I came up here for a purpose. If I break off after day two and go home with the casualties I've suffered, I've accomplished nothing. I've accomplished nothing. I have to do this. I, I, I have to roll the dice one more time because I think this army, my troops, my people can do it. And so between a combination of his belief in the Army of Northern Virginia's invincibility and the fact that he, he, he would go home empty-handed uh, with, without a victory, a clear, decisive battle, if you will, uh, he had to roll the dice there. And, I, you know, I, I, I get it. I mean, I understand that. It's like, what am I going to do? I can't walk away from this. I got, too much, I got too much skin in the game after two days of fighting here. And so he makes that decision, you know. That's my thought. Um, I got time for one more question. I'd, um, and I'd like to just go ahead and, and uh, wrap with this. It's, it's speculative, um, but um, when uh, Johnson goes down at Seven Pines and um, uh, uh, Gustavus Smith uh, takes temporary command of the army, has his nervous breakdown, Lee is then trotted out to, um, to assume the command of the army. Um, who behind Lee, if, if, if Lee is, is hurt, is there a, uh, is there a tertiary uh, a player there? Harry Tate wanted to know, he's out of uh, San Diego. Yeah, uh, that's a great question. You know, let me preface that by saying that the process of command transition, when a commander goes down, okay, in the Civil War is an ugly situation because it takes so long to find a new guy and then you got to tell him what's going on. And he probably doesn't know much more beyond what's going on in front of him. I think of Evander Law at Gettysburg when Hood goes down, you know, the time it takes to find Law and say, hey, you know, you're in charge of this uh, division. And then Law has to command, turn over command to his senior regimental commander and the company commander, you, you know, that's, it's a lousy process. The eventual answer is a deputy commander who understands the plan and can step in when the commander goes down. Now, more specifically, at this stage um, in the war, I think probably uh, the next guy, I, I can think of three. The first guy that would probably step up would be Jackson. Jackson was imbued from, from April 1861 with a constant focus on the offense. I mean, after he seized Harper's Ferry, he wanted to go north right then and there, and Davis wouldn't let him. Um, he was, he was always, I think he was the guy that pushed Lee at Chancellorsville. Let me do this, you know. Um, so I think Jackson uh, was the logical uh, hair, heir uh, to command if Lee went down. Second on the list, my list would be A.P. Hill. 
very aggressive 36 year old division commander at this time. Um, very aggressive. Um, doesn't mind to fight. Um, he's uh, spirited. Um, and, and, you know, and, and when Lee selects him to be a core commander, he calls him, you know, the best officer in his grade at division when uh, 1863 and then probably Longstreet. I don't think Longstreet has come into his own yet as the hammer against Jackson's anvil. But my third choice would be uh, Longstreet. He's solid. He's slow, but he's methodical and uh, he provides rock steady cool leadership uh on every occasion you know and that's one of the things you know the, the confederate commanders are not prone to panic um fitz john porter uh sedgwick reynolds on the other side are not prone to panic but heinzelman and uh, uh slocum and the other ones um they're not as rock steady in my view. So that, that's kind of my, my view. Glad to, uh, you know, glad to take a heat round if anybody <laughs> wants well, to take me on. I, I appreciate it very much. Uh, it's amazing how fast time flies when you're having fun, but uh, I do want to thank you for uh, taking the time tonight, Paul. Uh, for those of you who all are interested um, or want to see uh, this, this interview again, we should, um, uh, post it with the announcement of Bob Jenkins' talk, which I'll send out on um, uh, Friday. And um, if you're interested in the program, we'd love to uh, see you out uh, uh, with us in Richmond in uh, the middle part of April. And if COVID's still a problem, uh, knock on wood, we should be able to get out in, um, in May. We're, we're looking at some options. So uh, on behalf of the Blue and Gray, uh, Paul, I'd like to thank you very much for your time and candor and for all you who joined us. Thanks very much and have a great evening. Good night.